welcome to Geneva. Welcome to the annual Curators meeting. It's a great pleasure to have all of you here and the energy that you guys bring, it just cannot be described in words. This is my fourth ACM and I'm already experiencing it. A lot of hugs, a lot of smiles, a lot of cheers. So keep, keep it coming. Uh, so far we had a lot of introductions, like about the community, about the World Economic Forum and what was talking about day one, day two, day three and when is it going to start? It's going to start now. It's going to start now. One of the objectives of the Global Shapers community is to give young people a seat at the table. And today we are going to invite four of our curators to join in a panel discussion with me. And I'm going to invite Akhil from the Munich Hub. Please give him a big hand. <clears throat> Nadia from the Cape Town Hub. Amani Berry from the Minneapolis Hub and Dia Haeckel from Abu Dhabi Hub. Please take your seat. <clears throat> so there are so many issues that are affecting the world today. It could be the uh, global issues like, please, please have your seat. There are global issues like climate change. Uh, there is this uh, large scale conflicts and wars that's happening all over the world. You have regional issues like the, say the refugee crisis. I would not call it regional, but still it is like in Europe, it's a big issue. And even local issues, there are mass shootings, there are uh, the presidential campaign, and it's some kind of divisive rhetorics that's happening. So all kinds of issues that are happening. And we have a very privileged opportunity to come here and exchange uh, ideas and knowledge about these issues. But there are many people who don't have these voices. And who is better equipped than these young people to represent their communities and share some of their ideas and intelligence from their respective contexts. And that's what we are going to engage uh, in a discussion today. Thank you, all of you, for joining me on this panel. And I'm going to quickly go to Akhil from the Munich Hub. So Akhil uh, is, uh, is from Munich. His family has a lot of refugees who migrated during the ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka. And they are all over the world, um, in Germany, in Canada, in US. And uh, Akhil, Germany has opened its borders to refugees as a humanitarian imperative. Given the recent spate of attacks in Europe, is public sentiment still inclusive or is it shifting? Yeah, got it. <laughs> um, thanks for inviting me. Um, and I'll try to answer the, the question in a good way. Um, there's never uh, one truth. Um, if you look at the sentiment, um, it's really difficult to measure uh, the overall sentiment. Of course, there will be always people who think um, that we have too many foreigners in our country, um, too many refugees even, but I'm happy to say that it's not the majority. Um, that might shift at one point or another, but actually if you look at how complex the, the whole um, question is, uh, it's really, it gets really interesting. So the recent polls in Germany suggest that even far right-wing people say that Germany needs to take in refugees, but they say um, they, need to they need to take in real refugees. Um, so the question is, and the way I see it is, that we need to tell these people that we can't di differentiate um, between real refugees or people seeking shelter. They, they are the ones who seek shelter and we blame them now for uh, having attacks in, uh, in Western Europe while they, are, while they are actually fleeing these kind of situations back home. So that's certainly not right, and I think that's our responsibility um, to teach the people. And just one, uh, one quick remark on how the situation, how complex the situation is. Uh, many of you have shared uh, their condolences on the mass shooting in Munich that happened. Well, the interesting thing was in Munich, uh, the sources said, um, right, a few minutes after, um, they were sure that it was a right-wing uh, German who hated uh, foreigners. Other sources said he was a Muslim um, uh, wanting to, uh, to kill Germans. The real, uh, the truth is in between. He was actually of foreign descent, and he was a Nazi who was uh, trying to kill foreigners. So it's a mess, and it's never about who they, who they target. They always target us, and they're always crazy people, and we should not be influenced by that. Thank you, Akil. That was very helpful. <clears throat> Nadia, South Africa has been rocked by protests 
and um, corruption scandals. What is the mood among the young people in South Africa today? Thank you so much. Um, it's such an interesting time for my country um, in a very young and very active democracy um, as we recently went through elections, a very peaceful elections uh, at municipal level, largely peaceful. Um, but I would categorize it, and I'm broadly brush stroking here, into three categories of, of young people's moods. Um, and it's largely locational based. So I would say that young people in peri-urban areas are angry. And you can see that through violent protests. And that's because service delivery is non-existent um, or done really badly. And that's largely due to just widespread corruption in the entire system. And it's from the top down. The second mood, I would say, is disappointment. And that's with the urban youth. Um, and we see a lot of young people, um, and we had a huge campaign called Fees Must Fall, where young people were saying access to higher education is so expensive that it's become ex exclusive to only a few elite. Um, and at the time, we just found out that the president had spent $25 million on his personal homestead. So when you, you take that and you say, if he can spend that much on security upgrades, which included a pool and a crawl for his cattle, why can't we be funding um, education, tertiary education in South Africa? And along with that, you have a lot of young people who don't have access to economic opportunity. So those that have got a tertiary education are struggling to find jobs because of a few things around economic development, but also a lack of transformation in our country. So you're seeing young people who have degrees standing on the side of the road with billboards saying, I've got an engineering degree, can you hire me? And then the third category, I would say, are the hopefuls. And I broadly put all our global shapers in this category. It's a category of young people who really believe in the vision of South Africa and really want to make it great again. We're the guys who are um, making sure that we disrupt in a positive way the system. We see it's not working and we want to be part of the solution to fix it. And I say broadly that would be the South African mood at the moment. Thank you, Nadia. That's very helpful. Uh, moving to Amani. For all of us outside the US, it's very hard to understand the divisive tone that's shaping the election season right now. What do you think are the root causes and the undercurrents behind this? Um, well, I'm glad you asked about the root causes because I, I think the source of the divisiveness goes back uh, many years, all the way, I personally, I think back to the US Declaration of Independence uh, where it's written that all men are created equal, yet as we've seen historically, that has not always been the case. And I think we're at a point right now in the US where there's more groups coming in and diversity is increasing, and what we're seeing is some of the more privileged groups um, are resistant to some of the new voices that are entering the room. And I think moving forward, I think part of what is, is the, the divisiveness and what we need to do as a country is just accept uh, that there are new voices and to not let fear be the reason for why we cannot connect or come together as people. So I think the fear is what's driving a lot of the, a lot of the divisiveness. And, um, but I am hopeful and I'm optimistic that uh, as people recognize the, the skills and the uni unique abilities that different groups bring, I think that uh, the divisiveness can diminish. Thank you. And moving to Dia. Dia is originally from Syria, and she moved to Abu Dhabi. Now she's a shaper with the Abu Dhabi hub. Uh, Dia, in your opinion, there is this conflict that's happening in Syria, and uh, there's a lot of after effects because of the conflict that's coming out. What are some of the challenges that youth typically face in your region, generally in the Middle East? Um, I think the main problem is um, lack of education and lack of inclusion. Um, we've, we've witnessed a wave of extremism uh, and extremist leaders basically recruiting the youth. And this is because there is lack of education. These youth do not feel like they're involved in anything, like their life is worth nothing. So I might as well join this um, organization that will make me feel like just exactly like we feel part of a family here. To them, that's their family. 
but imagine the difference. And it's not only affecting Syria or the Middle East or the Arab world, it's affecting the world. Um, so I think, yes, and e extremism has, um, we all know that they have a um, hard power, but they also have a soft power where they take uh, advantage of the vulnerabilities of the youth and um, especially at times, uh, at difficult times. And then uh, they recruit them. They make them feel like uh, they, they matter, they're part of something. And of course, there's the economic reason, which is very understandable at these times. Thank you. So in the second round, like we are going to ask uh, all of you one question. And I would uh, start with Akil. And each one of you, if you can answer for the same question, keep it as crisp as possible. So Akil, you are identified as one of uh, Huffington Post's 50 most influential activists um, uh, in the refugees uh, space. Uh, what inspires you? What are your deeply held values? And uh, what inspires you to come and make a change in this world? Um, yeah, it's a hard question, but I think it's easy to answer. And I know I can't get off this stage uh, without mentioning Shaper's Love. Um, I promise to, to say this, but it's actually also what I really believe in. Um, not only the people in this room, but whenever we try to do a positive change in our community, we get something back. And even if you don't get it back immediately, we'll get it back eventually at some kind of point. And I really want to uh, raise one of the sentences that Yemi uh, told me in Shape Europe last year. He was uh, telling us that shaping is not about uh, when you have the mic like I have it right now or like when you're in the spotlight, but it's about the hard work that you do when you're actually in the community when no one is watching. And I think that pays off and it will come back at one point. Thank you. Nadia? For me, I think there are three big things. Um, again, it's integrity, purpose, and a strong sense of social justice. I've been a gender activist for such a very long time, and unfortunately my work is still far from finished, because we live in a world that's not equitable. And so every day I wake up making sure that this day is better than the day before, and that I create a world that my children won't have the same problems that I have, hopefully, um, and that they'll be living in a more equitable and free society. Thank you. Amani? I think what fuels my life is the ideal of freedom or the, the feeling that you can do or, or be anything. Um, I think about my ideal day would be simply waking up and just asking myself simply, what do I want to do today, and being able to do that. But I'm not comfortable being able to live that life or having a, a, a life full of that ideal day until uh, social justice and tell freedom is universal, felt by all people. Um, and I think I'm fortunate with the work that I do now to work with a lot of undergraduate students and to be able to see and witness. And I just, I love to watch when their minds become freer and they're discussing how, or the possibilities that they didn't even think were possible. And I think that's powerful and it's, it's inspirational for me to see. Thank you. Dia? Um, well, I'm passionate about breaking stereotypes and fighting ignorance. I feel, um, with my background, I hear a lot of stereotypes about my country, about my region, about my religion. There's a lot. And funny enough, I happen to be the first Syrian a lot of people meet. So imagine the responsibility. Um, Rocio is one of them today in Mexico. I was the first Syrian she meets. Um, actually, I could have been today on a boat in the middle of the sea, trying to find safety, trying to run away for a better place. I could have been in a refugee camp and met Akil. But instead, I'm here, and I'm representing a city that, um, I, that opened its doors for me, and that gave me a dignified life, which a lot of my fellow Syrians do not have, and they're far from achieving. So yes, I'm going to work a lot to break stereotypes to show the, true, uh, the truth of, of what we are really and what we can achieve. And I really, really, really need your help and for us as a whole, as a community, to show this. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, integrity, breaking stereotypes, these, these are definitely values that Global Shapers stand for. Thanks, uh, all of you, for sharing your personal values. Uh, we are moving to the next round, which is the last round. And each one of you have like approximately 90 seconds to answer uh, my questions. So I'll start with Dia again. What's your message to the current generation of leaders, be it in business or politics, uh, not just in your country, but globally? Uh, what responsibilities and duties do they have to the two billion youth in the world today? Thank you. Um, I go back to my first point, uh, providing education and inclusion and opportunity. When uh, I think extremism comes from lack of education and uh, and uh, lack of opportunity. So governments need to really focus on these two in order to bring back the youth. We, for example, in the Middle East, we, in the MENA region, we have 60% of the population under the age of 40. So there's a huge opportunity that we can, that we can uh, take advantage of. Um, so yes, these two points, I really, really stress on them. And uh, as Adrian said, I mean, all, all basically government or private sector, there's something missing, which is the youth voice. And if the past five years proved anything, despite all the chaos that happened, that youth has a voice and they want people to hear it. And we are just hearing youth voices already. So we have to thank World Economic Forum for that. Uh, <clears throat> Amani, same question for you. Like, what is, what is your message to the current generation of leaders? I think when I think about my current message to, or my message to the current leaders is, I, I think a lot about my grandfather, and in my mind, he's someone that, whether it was 1930, 1950, 2016, or it could be 2050, uh, he could adapt, and so, and he was able to change with the time. So in that, that's a lot of what my message is to the current leaders, is be able to be adaptive, and to recognize or acknowledge that the way things are being done, or you're doing them, don't have to be the way they're done forever. Secondly, I also think that my message to the leaders would be to challenge what is deemed impossible. And what I mean by that is frequently we as people state or we have ideas about what is possible and uh, but, po but what is possible sometimes perpetuates power and, and privilege. And so to be able to challenge what is possible and I think the group that does that uh, with the most ferocity is the youth group. They are the ones that are asking the questions of the, the, but why, but why, why is this happening? And I think to any leader, not only is the skill of, of listening critical, um, but particularly listening to a group of over two billion youth uh, that aren't yet ready to accept what is deemed impossible. Thank you. Now, uh, Nadia. Let's sh kind of uh, shift the question. What are our responsibilities as young people to work with existing leadership structures to create the positive change that we want to see in this world? You know, for the longest time, I didn't want to work with existing structures, um, partly because I'm anti-structure, but also because I just felt that there was so much bureaucracy and red tape involved, and they were so inefficient. But now that I'm older, and hopefully a little bit wiser, I realize that it takes both working in from within um, and externally, so it's great to stand with your billboard and pick it outside, but it's equally important to take a seat at the boardroom table and make your voice heard and be part of that change, because if the system is broken, there's no use us standing on the sidelines and complaining about it. We actually need to get in there, roll up our sleeves, and actually help to be the solution and fix it. And when we're part of the solution, we're able to mold it in a fashion that makes sense for the next generation to come. Okay. Be part of the solution. That's a very, very powerful thought. Akhil, what's, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, I completely agree. Um, it's really about not leaning back and really co just complaining about what the current leaders do, but actually to step in and do the same thing. Um, I recall uh, one of the models of our chancellor in Germany, Angela Merkel, who says, or has been saying the whole year, uh, wir schaffen das, which is a very German way of saying, uh, yes, we can, or basically, um, we can achieve this. And the emphasis is on we, we, uh, the community. It's not we, the politicians, uh, the bureaucracies, or the leaders, but it's 
us, it's, it's every one of us. And yeah, but if, if the change is not there, I guess we need to trust in, in our society, uh, in our strength. And I want to end with one quote, which really struck me in the last couple of days. It's, uh, why is a bird uh, not afraid uh, or not, doesn't have fear to fall from a branch? Well, it's because it trusts in its own wings. It might be cheesy, but it actually believes that it will uh, lift off when other uh, things break down. And I think we, as a community, as the Global Shapers, need to have that strength to believe in ourselves, that even if, if the time is not right, the change will come and we can achieve that. Awesome. The bird story is quite, quite powerful. OK, so we heard uh, from these four um, curators uh, on what are some of the issues that are going on in the respective uh, contexts. Um, Amani was talking about misinformation. And um, also, he was talking about instant discourse. Akhil was talking about how viral news just gets spread so fast. Nadia was talking about uh, the, if you don't have the right platform, how youth will get frustrated, leading to protests and scandals. They also spoke about some of their values. Dia spoke about uh, breaking the stereotypes. Amani was talking about the integrity. These are, these are values we also embody. And as we were thinking of what is our responsibility as young people, to work with leaders and what are our expectations for leaders, there were some several interesting thoughts like how do we change the system both internally and externally. Nadia was talking about uh, like giving youth a voice, giving a seat at the table and making them being part of the solution. These are very, very critical things. And the last one, Akhil, what you shared around uh, trust yourself, uh, the wind will change and uh, we, we can achieve. I think uh, these are fantastic words. And thanks for all your insights and bringing this local context alive. And that's how global shapers engage in discussions, share their perspectives, and add value in any uh, interaction that happens across the world. Thanks so much for joining us today. <laughs> <laughs>